see that. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I hope you can hear me and see me. Um, I'm sure um, Adira and everyone will let me know if, uh, if people can't see or hear me. But thank you very much for logging in. Um, I hope you've had a great day, um, a great week so far. My name's Oliver Hartley, um, and I'm really, really happy to be uh, providing you with some, some information uh, and uh, some some details around some amazing things that I've found from a um, huge group of leaders, people who are the, the best in their field, um, some of them the best in the world. Um, so just a little introduction. Um, so again, my name's Oliver. I'm the Global uh, Learning and Development Manager for a company called Rethink Group. Um, we are a talent management consultancy in the UK. And um, my job, is to make sure that every person in the business has the ability to reach their full potential. So that could be professional, it could be their leadership capability, or it could be some uh, some personal objectives they have. Um, and I've been doing this for um, about 10 years now. And um, I've seen pretty much, I think, everything there is to see in terms of people that developing even further than they expected, um, and particularly in the leadership space. But particularly for the last 10 years, 
um, I've, I've interviewed, um, questioned, um, engaged, had to buy coffee, cake, tea, um, all sorts of things to, uh, to be able to uh, meet with a variety of different leaders. And I've interviewed over 180 different leaders. And I asked them all the same question or, or base of questions. Um, and the first one I asked them was how do they maintain positive mindsets during a really difficult uh, spell, a really difficult time? And of course, we find ourselves, each and every one of us across the globe, um, in a difficult time right now. And so I think more now than ever, those secrets um, that I've been able to extract from these leaders are so important, more so now than ever. The great thing is, is that most of these leaders had to develop these right at the time when they had to lead people. So some of them were leading large teams, some of them were leading big companies, some of them were leading sports teams. Um, and they had to develop these behaviors and this mindset um, during, during, during that time, during that process. Um, with these secrets, you can start working on these very early. Um, you know, uh, some of these people didn't start working on these uh, behaviors and uh, techniques until they were um, 30, 35, 40. Uh, you guys, much younger than that, will be able to, to work on these um, from, from after today. Um, so there are a set of slides, a PowerPoint presentation that goes along with what I'm going to share with you, which will be shared with you after, um, after this lecture. Um, there's also a couple of documents that I'll share with the team so it can be shared with you guys, which will help you develop some of these techniques and some of these behaviours that we're going to talk about. So um, some of the leaders that I, um, I, I interviewed and engaged with, they come from all different industries, um, all different sectors. So um, one of them was a World Cup winning rugby captain. Um, another one was a leader of an $18 billion US business. Um, they've been actors, musicians, um, political leaders, um, high-ranking school teachers, there's been university professors, um, all people who are um, world-class at what they do. They're some of the best at what they do. Um, and the great thing is there's three secrets. There's three common themes that I was able to find, able to discover when speaking and interviewing with these leaders. Um, and this, th this series um, I call Lessons from Leaders and this is, I believe, the most important one. This is the one that when I've worked very closely with people, I've coached them to become better leaders, I've coached them to become better at what they do. This is the one that is most impactful. This is the one that has the um, biggest effect on people's performance, um, people's um, ability to reach their potential. So I'm really, really excited to share it with you all. Um, so, We'll get straight into those uh, behaviours and, and when I go through them, I'll tell you what the behaviour means, so what it really looks like when someone is actually doing it. And I'll give you some examples around um, how some of the leaders that I interviewed used it, developed it. Um, I'll give some examples from myself as well, because of course I've used what I found. I'd be crazy if I didn't use uh, these secrets that I've worked hard to find. Um, and I, honestly, I've, I've seen a huge impact um, in my ability to perform, reach my potential. Um, I can even kind of play the bass guitar you can see behind you now. And beforehand, I wouldn't have even got anywhere close. Um, so the first one, and so if you've got your pens and paper ready, do write this down. But like I said, we will share the, um, the presentation with you afterwards. Um, and, I'll sh and I'll make sure I share some of the documents that will help you develop some of these behaviours as well. So the first one um, is called stepping up. Now, stepping up is, I think, the most important of these three secrets, okay? Stepping up is the ability to perform and still develop yourself during a really, really difficult time. So think back 
to when you maybe had a project that you had to have finished really quickly, or if you play in a sports team um, when you were in a tournament or in a really, really difficult game, each and every one of you will have stepped up at some point. You just, you just wouldn't have realised it because you wouldn't have the frame of reference of calling it stepping up. But each and every person has stepped up. Now, how leaders do it differently, how great leaders do it differently, how world-class performers do it differently, is that they make sure that when they step up, they're able to put themselves out of their comfort zone. And that is the key thing. So the key thing is being able to step out of your comfort zone. Now, it feels, it feels uh, we feel nervous when we step out of our comfort zone. Um, sometimes it can hurt. Um, sometimes um, if we feel like we can't do it, but we only develop ourselves, our skill, our ability, our mindset. We only develop it when we step out of our comfort zone. Um, the great thing about your comfort zone is it starts like this, okay? So it could start quite small. And you step out, you cover it a little bit, and it grows a little bit. And what's brilliant, the more you do it, the easier it becomes to step out of your comfort zone. Because you, in your mind, in your subconscious, you have these things I like to call templates. And these templates are examples of where you've actually done something similar before. So using, uh, using a fairly basic example, um, imagine you're going to do a marathon. Um, now, I, I can't run marathons. Um, I can barely run at all uh, since I stopped playing rugby. Um, but it's mu- it'll be much easier to run a marathon if you've run four or five, uh, five kilometer races before, right? It will be very difficult to run a marathon if you've never run even a five or a 10 kilometer race before. Um, exactly the same if you were in a, uh, I don't know, a, a rally race. Imagine you've never raced one before. You're probably going to come last. Um, I know I would. Um, but if you've raced a couple of them before or even practiced around a track, you're going to have more success. Now, stepping up is really important because every time you step up, so you take responsibility for yourself in really difficult times or responsibility for a team um, and you keep pushing and developing yourself, you're building these templates which will enable you, make it easier to step up and step out of your comfort zone. And it's only outside of the comfort zone where growth really, really takes place. So I'll give you an example of of where I've seen this um, really, really effectively. So um, one of the leaders that I engage with is a a business owner in in, in the UK. Um, She owns and runs, manages um, four or five uh, media businesses. So they do a lot of social media for companies, um, lots of press releases, things like that. And the business has done incredibly well over the last, um, I think about eight or nine years, they've really, really grown. Um, This lady, she's got about 80 members of staff now um, and she runs the entire company. And she does an awful lot of um, things like uh, talks, speeches. Um, she presents in front of companies and things like this. It's a really important part of her job. Now, she started this company because she saw an opportunity in social media. She realized that it was going to be really big. It was going to be a really important part of our lives, of how companies operate. And it got to the point where she realized that she had to, she would soon have to start speaking to large audiences about it. Now, this was a lady who went at school, um, she was performing in a, a school play, like a theater production, got some of her lines wrong and ran off the stage crying. And she had that negative template in her head. So when, it, when she started thinking about talking to a group of business owners or a group of what could be customers for her, she felt incredibly uncomfortable, as you would imagine. So what she started to do was she started having conversations with slightly larger groups of people, slowly but surely. So firstly, she spoke to a group of friends. Five or six friends came round to her, her house for dinner and she presented to them what her company was all about. Um, 
So from there, she thought to herself, right, I can do it with people I know, people that won't laugh at me, um, people that will um, give me some, you know, feedback on how I've done. Next time I'll try and do it with some people that I don't know. So she then did it with a group of people, 15 people were invited into their offices. These were potential customers um, and she presented to them. And as you can see, more and more and more and more to the point now where she presents and talks in front of 400 people, um, something which would have been unimaginable to, to her only three or four years ago. So that is stepping up in a nutshell. Now, I've developed something called the five steps. Now, in your, you will see this in the presentation that we'll share with you guys, but imagine in your mind a staircase, okay? And on, there's only five steps on this staircase. Right at the top, step five, is the area that we, this is what you want, okay? Now, I'll give you my example. Um, I'm not very good at having uh, tough conversations with people. So I'm not very good at telling people that their performance or their work isn't good enough, for example. Um, but I know that I need to improve at it. So the top level five of my staircase is I am able to have those conversations, those difficult conversations, whenever I need to. At the bottom on step one is I'll avoid them. Um, and if anything, I won't do them. Don't worry, I'm not there anymore. <laughs> I'm not on number one. <clears throat> um, I'm more on level three now. But because I know what is on level five, where I need to go, I try and get myself to a point of having more difficult conversations more regularly. Now, I will share with you guys a document which will help you figure out what your steps are. What area of your mindset or skill set do you really, really want to improve? How do you really want to improve? Oh, we just, uh, I've got some questions for later on. Perfect. Um, so which part of your skill set or mindset do you think I know I can really improve in this area? Which one will be most impactful? So I really, really want you to think about that. That's one of the biggest takeaways from, from what we're discussing here today. Which area of your mindset or skill set do you want to improve that could eventually be really, really useful for you? Okay. Um, so um, some examples on there could be um, your organization. You know, if you consider yourself badly organized and it might have got you in a spot of bother and trouble before, choose organization. If it is public speaking, you know, speaking in front of a large group of people, just like the business owner I mentioned earlier, use that, for example. Um, if it's like me having difficult conversations with people, such as telling them that their performance isn't good enough or they need to work harder, make that your 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 steps but like i said i will share the document with you it will help you help you work through that um it's funny when you know what the top level is where you want to go it's much easier to step out of your comfort zone so that's stepping up i know i talk quite quickly um mostly because i really love what i do by the way and um we will share my email address um and my uh, Twitter handle with you guys afterwards. So if there's any questions or anyone wants to show me what their staircase looks like um, and, how, and how they might develop it, please, please do get in touch. The second one, and this, this, one, this one surprised me, to be honest. And I can already see we've got some really good questions coming through, so thank you guys. Um, number two is the ability to ask for help and advice during good and bad times. So this is a really, really important quality behavior to have, not just during a crisis, during a bad time, but also good. Um, all of the best leaders, all of the most effective leaders are able to ask for advice. Um, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer that anyone, anyone in this world can teach me something because I don't know everything. I don't know much, to be honest with you, only a little bit about what we're talking about today. Um, but everyone on this planet can teach me something I don't know. And I th if you use that mindset, there's nothing that you cannot learn. There's nothing you cannot find out from, from someone. Now, I'll give some good examples of a couple of leaders that used this and still use it today. Um, some of them are quite funny, actually. So one of the leaders that I interviewed um, is the global vice president of an $18 billion US business. Um, 
you would think that this person, this individual would have no problem when it comes to uh, knowing what to do, um, knowing how to act, knowing what to say, because they've got lots of templates, okay? Um, he's been through everything. Um, interestingly, uh, when he moved to his most recent company, uh, this is going back about three or four years ago, um, uh, he joined that company in a time of crisis. So they'd just been um, taken over by another company and they were asked that, you know, we need to cut cost. And as a result, we might need to let go of some people, let go of some staff and, uh, and some employees. And the first thing he did, believe it or not, was phone his mum. Um, <laughs> now, you know, lots of people I think would do that. They just wouldn't admit it. Um, and I asked him, you know, what, why, why your mum? And he said, um, she's the person that I trust most when it comes to um, talking about people and talking with people. Um, she's also the one that knows me the best and knows how I should react in this situation. And that for me was really, really powerful because if you've got someone that is confident and capable enough to run an $18 billion US business, I mean, I couldn't even run an $8 US business, let alone $18 billion. If you've got someone that is confident and competent to do that, yet they still seek advice uh, and help from their mum or anyone, um, that's, that's, that's the sign of someone with a really, really positive mindset in a crisis. Um, when we're in crisis, when we're in bad times, it's really easy for us to just focus on, on ourselves and uh, sort of internalise our conversations. And by that, I mean not talk, not talk to our friends or family or, or peers or colleagues, um, fellow students, whoever it might be. People have different opinions, different experiences and different ideas. And the best leaders, those people that develop the best and most positive mindsets during crisis and during good times are those that can ask for advice and ask for help no matter what. Um, so my, my takeaway for you guys, my action for you guys, what I'd like you guys to do is think about, think about what are your blind spots. And by that, I mean, there'll be, there'll be things that you are very good at. You might not know, you might do, um, but there'll be things that people will seek your opinion. They'll ask your advice. They'll ask your help on, but think about the stuff, which you're not so good at yet. You're not so good at, or something that, um, you know, you doesn't come very natural to you. Now I'll share with you mine. Um, my organization, um, can somewhat be left to be desired. Um, I, my eye for detail. So things like proofreading and checking of spelling, stuff like that, um, is not very good. Um, mostly cause I'm not very patient. However, I have a very, very good friend who I used to work with called Matt, who is one of the best people I've ever met when it comes to understanding how processes work, how they would impact people, and his eye for detail as a result is amazing. So anything that I need to have checked, anything that before I share with people, I'll ask my friend Matt to have a look because I know he will find, if there's a problem in there, he will think or find it. And that's a really, really great person to have. Now, I call those people that you have, I call them my tribe. So who do you need in your tribe? Who do you need that would help you develop a part of your mindset or your skill set that would really, really help you balance out, okay? So like I said, mine's organization, an eye for detail, really, really big one for me. And I'm really thankful that I've got someone in my tribe that can help me with that. Um, so think about what do you need? So what are your blind spots? Yeah. Think about what part of your mindset or skill set that needs developing, needs help. Um, and then try and find people, put add them into your tribe. It can be anyone. You know, it can be teachers, it can be friends, it can be colleagues, it can be parents. Um, figure out first what your blind spots are. And then secondly, build your tribe around that you'll learn a lot from these people. So that was that was secret number two. Um, again, really, really important because uh, we get such a better view of uh, not just the world, but of our capability, 
I mean, our mindset just through just through doing that. Um, number three, number three. This is the final one. Um, now you could argue that number three is the most important, um, the uh, most significant, and it underpins the rest of them. So we'll spend a little bit of time um, going into that in more detail. But this, number three, is the ability to focus on the process and not just the result. So I'm just going to repeat that. It's the ability to focus on the process and not just the result. Now, the reason why this is really important comes from um, a researcher, a psychologist, a lady called Carol Dweck. Now, some of you, I don't know, um, they talk about it in um, schools and colleges in the UK, uh, in England a little bit, um, but it's something called the positive or growth mindset. Now, it's so important in leaders and every single effective leader, world-class leader that I've met and world-class performer that I've met, they, they have the growth mindset. And the growth mindset is focusing on the power of um, the power of not yet. Okay, the power of yet. And the power of yet is I can't do that yet. I don't know that yet. That's the growth mindset, as opposed to or versus the fixed mindset, which is I can't do that. I don't know how to do that. I can't do it. I can't speak that language. I can't play that musical instrument. I can't talk in front of three hundred people. The growth mindset says. I, I can't talk in front of 300 people yet. I can't play that musical instrument yet. I can't speak that language yet. And it seems like a really, really subtle difference, and it is, but the growth mindset is really important. Now, there's some really, really good examples um, of people with the growth mindset, and one of them, which I'll share with you, um, is a, a international rugby player. He doesn't play anymore, he's now retired. But an international rugby player um, who was lucky enough to play for England um, and what is known as the British Lions, which is where England, Wales, Scotland and Ireland all come together to play as one team. Um, and uh, he, he was made captain of his team, his professional team, at the age of 20. And the reason being, um, the four other captains, there were four other captains before him, all got injured at the same time. He did not expect to be captain. Um, anytime soon, certainly not at 20 years old. Now, the first thing he did um, was uh, was speak to a couple of people around him and say, right, okay, what do I need to be captain? What do I need to do to be captain? And he got a lot of different mixtures of advice, different opinions. So, he, you know, he asked his tribe, which is all really good. Um, and instead of thinking to himself, I can't do this. I'm only 20 years old. Four captains ahead of me. Uh, they've, they've played hundreds of games more than I have. Um, so he kept telling himself, um, uh, I'm not a captain yet, I'm not a captain yet, I'm not a captain yet. Um, and he kept on repeating this to himself every single day for the week before the first game where he'd be captain. Um, and then as soon as he was running out onto the field, um, he was kept on saying to himself, I'm the captain now, I'm the captain now. And it was really, really powerful for me to hear that, that this person is trained their entire life, has played lots of games of rugby, incredibly, incredibly good rugby player, you know, top, top, top of top of uh, the uh, the league in terms of, of, of professional players, um, had to use the power of the, uh, the growth mindset to make him believe that he could be a captain. And there's a really interesting study that goes along this work that uh, Carol Dweck did. Um, if you have the chance to look at the book, pick the book up, um, it's called Mindset by Carol Dweck. Um, I'll send, um, with some of the materials, I'll send um, uh, a, a, just a quick Google search so you can see what, see what it looks like. But it's a really, really great book, and it really helps you understand the, how powerful the, the growth mindset is and how it works psychologically. Um, but it's all about praising and focusing on the process as opposed to the result. Now, I'll give you another good example. If you focus on the result, uh, and the result, for example, is uh, my bass guitar. I was pointing the wrong way there, not dancing. But that bass guitar you see there, um, I only started learning bass guitar because I wanted to play a particular song. Um, 
And I soon realized that actually it's not that easy to play. Thankfully, I'd read Carol Dweck's book. When I first picked up that bass guitar, I, it sounded terrible. Um, it couldn't even, oh, sorry, we've got a question. What was the name of the book again? Um, it was Mindset. So Mindset by Carol Dweck. Uh, in Dweck is spelt D-W-E-C-K. -E it's a great book. Um, so that bass guitar, um, when I started playing, it sounded terrible, really, really bad. Um, but if I just focused on, it sounds rubbish now, and not the process of improving, I would have given up. And that's what the really, really important part of it is, um, when we focus on the result, and if the result doesn't arrive, we feel deflated, we feel gutted, we, we stop, okay? Whereas if we focus on the process and praise ourselves mentally on the process and how we're improving, psychologically, we get a little spike of the feel-good chemical that is in our brains called dopamine. Um, great thing about dopamine is that our brain and our body like it, so we actively want more of it. So if we keep focusing on the process of improving, and it could be a bass guitar, it could be if you're really into uh, into dance, it could be improving your, your dance routine. If it's singing, improving the process of singing. If you're in football, it could be your fitness of being able to play 90 minutes. Um, it could be anything. But great leaders, even in times of crisis, have the growth mindset. Um, I've found in the business that I work for, the company I work for, that it's more important now than ever because, of course, the whole world together is going through uh, a, cr a crisis because of the coronavirus. Um, I know you guys are, uh, are at home, um, obviously, and doing your studies from home, which um, I know if I was back in school, I would have found really strange. Um, but we're all going through it together. And I think more now than ever, the ability to think, right, I can just take care of the process because the result I can't control. You can't control the result, you can control the process. So if you focus and reward yourself on running a quality process, no matter what it is, the result will eventually take care of itself. So you will see at some point, the bass guitar again, um, I will be able to play uh, the song Forget Me Nots by Patrice Russian. It's really difficult. Um, hopefully some of you will go and listen to it now because it's a really, really good song. Um, but it's very difficult. One day I will be able to play it. But right now, I'm just focusing on the first 10 seconds. <laughs> and if I can get that first 10 seconds done, that's where I get my reward. So it's that ability, that ability to be able to focus on the process because um, the process will take care of the result. That's, that's number three. Now, again, you can argue that that underpins the other two. Because if you haven't got a growth mindset of, how, how can I develop my late leadership capability when I'm not leading people right now? Um, then if, you, if you've got that mindset, it'll be really, really difficult. Whereas if you can think to yourself, I'm not a leader yet. So again, it's the power of yet. I'm not a leader yet. But what can I do to develop the attributes of a great leader, which are mainly influence? If you can influence people and convince people of something that is a good thing to do or a right thing to do or a way to work, you can put yourself in the situations that will develop that. So just to uh, summarize before going on to some of the questions, we've got a few popped in, which is great. Um, number one, stepping up. So it's the ability to perform and develop yourselves no matter what. Okay. Um, now a little tip for that again is put yourself in the position where you need to step up. Now some of you would have done it already whether it be your friends, family, in school, on projects at school, through sport, whatever it might be. Um, I've, got, uh, I've got a friend who uh, really, really needed to develop that capability of stepping up after a conversation we had. Um, and he started being the one that arranges all of the stuff that we do as friends, whether it be going out for dinner, going on holiday, whatever it might be. And the reason why that's important is that if, it, if, it, if it's not him that does it, it doesn't happen. The, the holiday, you know, doesn't go ahead. It gets cancelled. We don't meet up for dinner. So he needs the buck to stop with him. And what that's doing is building template in his head of him being the responsible one. 
So find times and occasions where you can be the one that takes the responsibility to do it, okay? That'll help you develop stepping up into your mindset. The second, the ability to ask for help and advice. Like I said, this is a more of a reflection technique, okay? Think, think what your blind spots are. Like I said, mine's organization and eye for detail. Um, so I've, I've built people, I've put people into my tribe that are amazing at that, that are really good at it. And I'm sure, um, I hope anyway, that I'm in a couple of people's tribes when it comes to developing people um, and developing leaders. Um, so think about what your blind spots are. And it's fine to have more than one, believe me. I've probably got about 319. I just haven't found them yet. <laughs> um, and then actively build your tribe and try and get them from a broader place as you can. Friends, family, colleagues, people from sports clubs, whatever it might be. Um, and the third and final one was the ability to focus on the process and not just the result and have the growth mindset. Um, the growth mindset, like I said, underpins all of this. Every single top performer um, and leadership, um, just as a caveat to that, leadership doesn't have to mean leading people. Leadership is setting an example and leading yourself. Um, it can also mean, of course, leading other people, but you can't lead your, you can't lead other people if you can't lead yourself. And that's why you guys are in a brilliant position now to develop the leadership ability of yourself to lead yourself before you go off into your careers, be that further academically or into a business, whatever it might be. Um, you, you've got a bit of a head start to develop your leadership capability there. Um, so let's look at some questions, shall we? I'm just going to look at the, uh, the chat function here. This is the first time I've used um, Facebook Live, so hopefully it's gone quite well. So let's have a look at a question here. Um, what do you think are the first steps for us as students to the road of becoming global leaders? That's a really, really good question. Really good question. Um, do you know what? I wish I asked that question um, when I was in school. Um, <laughs> so I think the first step, the first step is, is the leadership of yourself. Okay, really important. And there's another book for you, actually. If you can find this one, I'm just going to grab it out of my bookshelf here. This book here um, is called uh, Developing the Leader Within You by John C. Maxwell. Um, this is the first book I read, not ever, um, on, on leadership. It was recommended to me by um, the, the chap that runs the $18 billion US business, funny enough. Um, and it's by far the most important trait of becoming a global leader. Now, one of the pieces of advice I'd give is find what... Find out what you're really passionate about. Find out what you really want to change. Find out what you really, really want to develop yourself into. So for example, if you're really interested in, so for example, mine is developing people. Um, I've worked really, really hard at making sure that I can be the best I can be in developing other people. So I'm always looking for opportunities to, to help develop people, such as obviously where we are right now, as well as, doing it in person, um, absolutely meeting people, reading literature on it, that's the first step you can take. Absorb as much as you can into something you're passionate about. Um, because if you're passionate about it, it makes it a whole lot easier to, to develop the skill set that you need. Um, and there's a famous phrase, you know, if you do what you love, you won't work a day in your life. That's really true of if you can develop yourself uh, in an area that you're passionate about. So just to summarize the first steps as students to being global leaders, develop the ability to lead yourself. Um, I certainly wish I did when I was at school. That was a really good question, by the way. Um, we've got another one here. Um, how does engaging in school activities uh, facilitate becoming a leader? Really, really good question. Um, do you know what you won't realize, but you will be by engaging with teachers, your fellow students, particularly in group work and things like projects, you will be subtly developing your leadership skills without even realizing it. And I promise you this, someone told me exactly the same thing about probably about 20, no, no, about 18 years ago when I was 
uh, when I was uh, a teenager, I think I was about 14, 15. I've just given my age away then, haven't I? Um, and someone told me that was the very same thing. And I thought to them, I can't see how that's developing my leadership capability. But what it's doing is building those templates that I mentioned. That if you want to accelerate that or develop them further, find opportunities where you can. So it could be volunteering. It could be as part of a, a certain group or a certain club, whether that be in, in the UK, we have something called Scouts, which is um, they're an organization that do lots of like outdoor activities, things like uh, camping and orienteering, um, like survival skills and stuff like that. And they're brilliant for developing leadership skills. Um, so in, in school activities, you will be doing it without even realizing, but thinking of some of the school activities, think about how you could put in the three secrets that we talked about. You know, when it comes to stepping up, how about if you try and lead the project or a piece of group work? You know, if perhaps if you're a little bit nervous about speaking in front of a group, nominate yourself to do it. Um, you can absolutely develop those whilst doing those school activities. A really good question, thank you. Um, so on to the next one. Um, is a crisis an opportunity to trigger leadership capability? Absolutely. Um, you could argue, you could say that it is the best opportunity. Um, now, just a little insight. If a business asks me to develop their um, the leadership capability of one or several people, I often ask, um, I wish you told me that before they needed to lead people. Because like I've said, people need to lead themselves, be able to lead themselves before they lead others. Um, but it's what's funny, it's in a crisis, we recognize leadership capability more. And that's because we look, we seek for it. Um, now, there was a famous psychologist that said, um, fundamentally, the one thing that people want from leaders is for them to make them feel safe. And, and I really, really agree with that. And I think that's why in times of crisis, when we see leadership capability, it's really obvious to us, okay? But it's absolutely a great time to trigger that capability because what is more out of our comfort zone than a crisis? I imagine each and every one of us, uh, including me, um, are out of our comfort zone right now. Um, I've never delivered a virtual lecture like I'm doing now um, to a group of people that are probably smarter than me, um, in a different country. So for me, I'm a little bit out of my comfort zone, um, but it's great because afterwards I'll know that I've stretched my ability um, to, 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 to be able to have those conversations. So um, absolutely a crisis is an opportunity to trigger leadership capability. Sometimes you'll see people react positively um, like you would have never expected. Sometimes the leaders come from the most uh, uh, unassuming uh, people and unassuming places. So really, really good question. This this situation that we find ourselves in globally gives us an amazing opportunity to, to develop our leadership capability and to show off what we're good at as well. So really good question. Thank you for that one. Um, oh, how does school life determine the future of leadership for students? Um, this is a good question. Um, how does school life determine the future of leadership for students? Um, that is, that's a hard one to answer in all honesty. Um, and this is one of the other points as well, actually, is you won't always have the answer. Do I know the answer to that? I don't know the answer to it, but I have an opinion. I have an opinion on it. Um, so I don't know about the school system in Kosovo, but I know about the school system in England and the UK that um, I don't think that the school system in the UK is set up to develop uh, leadership within individuals. So much like one of the earlier questions we had, um, it can be quite hard to develop leadership ability and capability and behaviours and mindset when just thinking of the school scenario. There's absolutely opportunities to do it, and some schools are much better than others. Um, your your guys' school might be brilliant at it, and I, and I really hope it is. Um, and if and if the school wants to improve it and wants some help on it, I'm, I would love to love to help. Um, but it's when you want to develop your own leadership capability, 
think outside of school as well. Now I know school is a huge of what you do. You know, it's more than half of your your day every day, five days a week. Um, but look for things like voluntary opportunities or clubs that you can get involved in. Like I said, there could be some organisations that could do with people getting involved and people supporting and helping. Um, you know, lead lead things like projects and uh, and activities where you can. Um, because yeah, I don't think. And again, I'm only speaking from the UK, but I don't think schools do enough to determine or develop the, the future of leadership for students. Um, cool. So this is a good question. Uh, what, in your opinion, are some of the best activities to do in schools to develop leadership skills? Really, really good question. Um, how long have you got? Because I could, I could talk all day and all night about this. Um, but I know it's probably not too far from dinner time in Kosovo, um, although you might eat it later than we do in the UK. It's like six o'clock every day in the UK. It's really boring. Um, so some of the things that you can do. Um, one of the things that I'm really passionate passionate about, and one of the things I think that can really, really develop those leadership skills are putting, again, putting people out of their comfort zone, putting students out of their comfort zone, and that is taking them out of the routine of the typical school day is number one. So let's think of an example. Um, I don't know how your guys' lessons are structured, but I remember mine, you'd have uh, a lesson, a break, lesson, lesson, break, sorry, lesson, break, lesson, break, uh, double lesson, lunch, and then so on and so forth. Um, at some point, you can, without telling the students, um, arrange for one of those lessons to be replaced with a different activity. Now, these could be challenging activities like um, building uh, something out of, you know, scrap, paper, card, um, and analysing, observing who is doing what, the conversations that are being had. Um, there's loads of activities that we could talk about offline, actually. There was one which um, I mentioned my the person in my tribe, Matt, from earlier, um, he uses a, a superb um, card game where he uh, sets the rules um, and, and changes them a bit later on um, when the participants aren't looking. And it, all, and it develops these leadership capabilities and people of taking, uh, taking responsibility, stepping up in those moments. So there's loads of activities that I can share with you um, because uh, we can absolutely, and I think we should be, developing... Uh, individual's leadership capabilities um, much younger. And I'm, again, I'm speaking from the UK. Um, it's something that I try and do with my children. Um, I coach a children's football team as well. And it's something that we're trying really hard to do. But there's loads of activities we can do. So um, let's, obviously, we, we're connected on LinkedIn so we can share some ideas on that because I think it's a fantastic idea of getting some activities. Um, but anything that is out of the normal school day is step one. And then an activity where we're really challenging them and we're constantly changing the, the environment or the conditions of the activity to making them react is, is, is often the ones that are most impactful, um, but a great idea. And yeah, I'd love to, love to help you with that. Uh, let's have a look. Um, cool, a question from a seventh grade student who doesn't have a Facebook account. Um, what are some books that really relax you and help with everything going in your life? That's a really, really good question. Thank you for asking that question. Um, I read quite a lot, um, and I've got my I've got my bookshelf here. Um, so I've got. It depends what interests you is my advice, um, but I've got two books in particular that ha that help me relax, that help me um, switch off that help sort of calm that inner voice that we all have, you know, at the end of a busy day or if we've read or watched the news and it can be quite stressful, you know, and, you know, there often only seems to be bad news that's always put online or on, on the news or that sort of stuff. Um, I'm going to grab two of them out of the uh, out of my bookshelf. So bear with me. Um, the first one is this. Actually, there's three. And where is it? Uh, here we 
go. So, um, apart from books about um, my favourite sports people, um, be that Leo Messi, um, be that um, Andres Iniesta, you can probably tell I'm a Barcelona fan, or autobiographies of people I really like. So, for example, the musician Prince. I, I, those really help relax me, uh, distract me. Um, there's some really, really good fiction books as well um, that, are, that I tend to tend to read. Um, but these, this book, it's called Calm. Now, you might, you guys might have heard of something called mindfulness. Um, it's kind of like med meditation, I suppose, um, but a little bit, I think, easier to access. Now, this book, um, it's not, it doesn't say it's written by anyone, but I know there's an app. So there's a, there's a, there's a smartphone app for it as well. Um, so it's called Calm by Michael Acton Smith. Um, and this book um, is really, really practical. It gives you loads of ideas of how to, to relax and calm down at the end of the day. Um, I also listen to a lot of music with my headphones in um, because that helps, um, helps me relax afterwards. Um, I've also got this book called Happiness by Design by a guy called Paul Dolan. Um, and this has been really good because it talks about finding the things that you really enjoy um, in everyday life and, and really taking stock of, you know, of what, what you enjoy. And I think particularly in this time when it's really, really uncertain, when, you know, times are really stressful for all of us, um, I think it's really important to find uh, you know what's what what's good in our in our everyday, and there's definitely things that we all take for granted. Um, just for everyone, by the way, there's the mindset book by Carol Dweck as well. As you can see, being read a lot, it's almost falling apart. Um, just for all of you, actually, this this book um, is really good. Um, How to change the world by John Paul Flintoff. Um, someone talked about being the question about, you know, the first step to becoming global leaders. Um, this, it didn't necessarily relax me. Um, however, it certainly gave me a lot of passion and it really, really lit my enthusiasm. So that's also a really, really good one. Um, so, yeah. But remember, if anyone wants to know the names of these, we need to do is get in touch if you didn't catch them there. Um, Oh, question from Fortessa. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Um, my pronunciation of Kosovo names is often really, really bad, um, mostly because, again, my language skills are terrible. Um, which one, observing the leader or practice uh, practice leading, will help more into becoming a better leader? That's a really, really good question. Um, thank you for asking that. So um, neither uh, is is more important than the other at the stage which you guys will find yourself, okay? Um, think of it almost like, so if we've got a, a simple graph, whilst you guys are still really, really young and you're still developing your leadership capability, observing leaders can be really, really useful. So if on this axis here, we're talking about time, so your age, and right now you guys are really young, you're here, the level of observing should be really high. Because of course you don't get you you're not going to get the chance to practice it as much. However, still really really work hard to find times to practice it. Because as you get older, you'll need to observe less and you will need to practice more. So observing goes down, practice will go up. So um, neither one is I'd say more important than the other. But for now, it'll be easier for you guys to observe um, how leaders operate, what they do. Um, and then practice. But if you can do them at the same time, that's that's the magic formula. That's where it really happens. If you can if you can observe a leader doing it and then put it into practice, or maybe and maybe put your own spin on what that leader has done, that's where you'll really really see results. That's a really really good question. Um, just by asking really good questions like that, you're already developing a leadership capability of asking really good questions at the right time. So, well done. You're practicing it already. Here we go. Um, I'm interested to know, since every person is different from one another, does that mean there should be more than one leadership style? And how can you know which leadership style suits a person best? Um, so it helps self-development on leadership skills. 
That is a really, really good question. How do you guys know to ask these questions? Um, I, again, I wouldn't have when I was your guys' age. Um, absolutely. Um, so leadership theory is really interesting, and it's um, it's changed and adapted over a long time. And you're right, there are so many different leadership styles out there. Um, I think the most effective leadership style, um, and this sounds like a bit of a, a cheat answer, but the most effective leadership style is the one that feels most natural to you. Now, there's two reasons for that. Reason number one is that if you are uh, utilizing or using a leadership style that is not natural to you, people will notice. People will see that you're um, stressed when, uh, when, when working or engaging, communicating with people, and they'll see that you're having to work really, really hard to put that style on. You know, so it's just like if, for example, if someone is introverted, it's really difficult for them to pretend to be extroverted. It takes a lot of mental and emotional energy. It's the same with the leadership style. So, for example, my leadership style um, is amiable. So I care a great deal about people. Um, my The opposite of amiable is someone that's a driver. And this is the traditional, um, outdated version of a leader of someone telling people what to do. Um, so if I try to be a driver, if I'm like that all day, every day, I'm exhausted and people can see that it's not my natural style. So people are less inclined to follow me. Um, and effectively that's what leadership is. Um, a leader will have people follow them, whether that is follow their ideas, follow their advice, follow their guidance, follow their instruction, whatever it is. Um, the second reason why it's really important um, is that, uh, like I said, it's very, very stressful to use a style that is not your own, okay? Now, you know what person you are, what suits your personality. Some people are quite outspoken and can speak directly, and those people are really, really good leaders. The simple fact that people know where they stand when they are communicated with them. Uh, my brother is very much like this. Um, you know, he will tell you what he thinks and what he thinks is the best idea and the best process for something um, without me even asking him. But it's really useful skill to have. My style, I won't do that. Um, but I will be more, I will talk people through it. I'll ask them questions. So I'll probably get to the same result, but it might take me a little longer. So there's no perfect leadership style. It all depends on the situation. There'll be situations where a amiable uh, leadership style, so being uh, concerned about the people and the process is the, be the best style or the most effective style for the situation. There'll be times where a more direct style um, of leadership is, is more effective. So think about the time we, you know, the, the, the crisis we find ourselves in now across the globe. Um, just in the UK, um, we are meant to be on not on lockdown, but we are being told we should stay in the home as much as possible. We're allowed out for one hour a day for exercise, to go to the supermarket, to buy food, that sort of stuff. Um, but I see people out lots more than that. Um, and so the leadership style, perhaps, to, um, to improve that would, have been, would be you are staying in your house. If you go out, you are being fined. So that would have probably been more effective than um, please don't go out for more than an hour. Um, of which is definitely not working. But that's a really good question. You're absolutely right um, that there are many different leadership styles. But the great thing is that of, of the 180 leaders that I spoke to, the three secrets apply no matter what your leadership style is. So that's a really, really good question. Thank you. Again, a really good question. Um, natural, natural leadership questions, I'll tell you that. Um, so... Um, I don't think there's any more questions. Um, we've ju we finished just in time, which is great as well. Uh, usually I waffle on for, for, for much longer. Um, but thank you very much for everyone for logging in. Um, I know you've probably had a long day of studies uh, and you're probably desperate to have a bit of a, a break um, and probably something to eat. I know I am. Um, but we'll share with everyone the slides, the presentation slides that um, I've put together with it. Um, we didn't use them because you wouldn't have been able to see me talking if we had the slides up at the same time. The slides look much, much better than I do because I've shaved my beard off. It looks very strange. 
Um, but I'll also share a list of the books that I've mentioned as well. Um, and I'll also share a couple of documents that will help you um, build the steps that I talked about. Um, and, and I'll summarize as well the actions that you guys can take to help build your leadership style and your positive mental attitude, your positive mindset during a time of crisis. But thank you very much, guys. Um, have a great evening. Um, and hopefully I'll speak to you guys again at some point soon. Take care. Bye.